My name is Greg Peterson. I am the host of the Urban Farm Podcast and Urban Farm U. We teach people about growing their own food. And I would like to introduce Kathy Jens from GardenCom to tell us about the evening. Good evening. Thanks, Greg. So welcome to our GardenCom Authors Talk about Gardening Party. We're glad you're joining us tonight. It's going to be a great gardening fun. Uh, my name is Kathy Jens. As Greg said, I'm Secretary of Garden Communicators International, the commonly known as GardenCom. We are a proud partner with the National Garden Bureau to introduce some amazing garden writers who belong to both of our organizations. GardenCom members are professionals in the green industry world. They speak to home gardeners and to those in the green industry trade through a variety of mediums, such as photography, um, as in-person speakers, radio, podcast hosts like Greg and I, garden authors, and more. Now we'd like to turn it over to our co-sponsor, National Garden Bureau's Diane Blazik. Welcome everybody. Um, I am Diane, as Kathy said. I'm the executive director for National Garden Bureau as well as All America Selections. Um, we continue to be very excited about these book parties. We think it's a great service and a wonderful way to get to know more about these book authors. You're, you're going to really enjoy some of the insights that you hear tonight. Um, as far as National Garden Bureau, believe it or not, we are a 103-year-old organization, so we've been around a long time and our mission is to educate and inspire people to garden so it doesn't matter what kind of gardening you like to do hopefully we will inspire you in some way um, I believe Shelly just posted uh, the website our web link in the chat so if you need to know anything more about National Garden Bureau there that link is there um, so now I'm going to toss it back to our moderator and host Greg Thank you, Diane and Kathy. Now I'd like to introduce each author and have them share a little bit about themselves. Meet Lisa Steinkopf, author of House Plant Party, Fun Projects and Growing Tips for Indoor Plants. Hello, I'm Lisa Eldred Steinkopf. The house, they know me as the house plant guru. Um, my good friend Nancy gave that um, name to me. I grew up in rural uh, Michigan, uh, mid-Michigan near Mount Pleasant, which probably doesn't any doesn't doesn't matter to any of you, but I grew up in the country. So my brother and I were outside all the time. We were outside playing. We were outside climbing trees. I have three older brothers, but my brother closest to me was my um, <laughs> my comrade and all that. Um, and he he loves plants, too. He's actually has his degree in forestry. So we're kind of a plant family. So I got but I got my love of house plants from my mom and my grandma and my flowering house plants are from my grandma. She had the most beautiful African violets. And I spent a lot of time with her. She just lived down the road, as you would say. Um, I met my husband in horticulture classes at Ferris State University. So um, I married a man who owns a garden center. <laughs> so that worked out well, right? Um, uh, and I have two, two daughters. One is expecting twins in May. I'm gonna be a grandma, so excited. So um, there you go. That's probably everything you need to know about me and more. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Lisa. Next, I'd like to introduce Dwayne Pancost, author of The Geriatric Gardener, Adaptive Gardening Advice for Seniors. Thanks, Greg. I uh, graduated, or I studied landscape architecture and then transferred across campus and got a degree in radio and television. I've been writing marketing communications uh, information for since now. 1961 and since 1970 specialized in serving uh, landscape lawn care tree care companies and their trade associations and suppliers and as I turned 80 and my uh, responsibilities with the firm uh, started going down I was looking for a project and I read an article in, in a trade magazine uh, in which the uh, editor was suggesting that landscape uh, professionals learn about the special needs of senior citizens in gardening. And she said that it was the outdoor component of the aging in place movement. And so uh, I started researching it. Uh, Plus, I had a bad knee and 
uh, was feeling the, the r ravages of old age, so we say. And I decided to get launched as quickly as I could. So I started a blog called The Geriatric Gardener. And then I took the best of them and edited them, edited them, yeah, into a, a book. Awesome. Thank you, Dwayne. And I'd like you to meet Susan Mulvihill, author of the Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. Take it away, Susan. Hi, everybody. Yes, I am excited to announce my brand new book, The Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. It just came out last month, and it is the companion book to the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, which is all about insects, both the damaging kinds and the beneficial ones. I am the Sunday Garden columnist for the Spokesman Review newspaper in Spokane, Washington, and I've been a master gardener for over 20 years. I am absolutely passionate about organic vegetable gardening. Each week I create a video on all different kinds of gardening techniques and topics because I want everyone to be successful at growing a garden. I just realized that I have over 470 gardening videos on my YouTube channel, which wow. is Susan's in the Garden. And I don't know how that happened, but they all added up. I post every day to Instagram and Facebook Facebook under the handle of Susan's in the Garden. And my website is, surprise, susansinthegarden.com. And I'd like to thank the National Garden Bureau and Garden Communicators International for inviting me to take part in this fun event. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. And next, I'd like to introduce Teresa Woodward, author of American Roots, Lessons and Inspiration from the Designers Reimagining Our Home Gardens. Thank you, Greg. In my work, I combined two of my passions, gardening and writing. I started off as a journalist writing feature stories and later zeroed in on gardening, garden writing, as I started uh, gardening at a brand new home where I learned some of the joys and challenges of gardening. I enrolled in the Master Gardener training program to learn more and started um, writing some garden assignments for local magazines, and eventually started writing garden stories mm -hmm. for regional and national magazines like Country Gardens and Better Homes and Gardens. Today, I'm the contributing garden editor at Midwest Living and also working on a second garden book with Timber Press. I'm super excited to be writing in a time when more and more people are discovering the garden world and I hope to inspire them with other gardener stories and lessons like those that we learned in American Roots. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. Now let's get to know the author personalities <clears throat> and ask them some questions. First question, what compelled or inspired you to write your book? Let's start with Lisa. Okay, so this is my new book, Bloom. Oops, sorry, can you see that? So um, I wanted to write a more targeted um, book than my others, which you can kind of see behind over there behind me, which was just, you know, about house, house plants in general. But I really wanted to write books. I wanted to write some uh, series of books like about African violets, begonias, you know, just kind of target uh, some different plant families. And um, they were like that morphed into let's write a book about um, flowering house plants overall, which here we are today. So I think everyone needs a little green in their lives. But if that green can have flowers, two, why not, right? We all love flowers. So they brighten your day, they brighten your room. And I think everyone can have a, hiring, a flowering house plant in their home or even a few and have flowers every day of the year. So I wrote this book to help people understand the care for flowering plants and hopefully introduce them to some plants that they don't, they hadn't, didn't know about before. So flowering plants seem like a mystery to some people. And I thought, well, I want to take the mystery out of some flowering house plants so they could be successful and have flowers in their home. You know, until I started talking with you, I didn't realize that house plants could bloom. So I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Dwayne, what compelled you or inspired you to write your book? Well, I could say it. Uh, every writer wants a legacy. And what better legacy is there than writing a book? But the real reason was I went one day to try and retrieve uh, one of my early posts 
for my archives. I'd been writing for a couple of years and uh, it was a, a chore. It took me about a half hour of just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So um, I sat down and said, if, if this is frustrating me, what's it doing for my readers? And uh, I thought a lot of senior gardeners aren't into the digital age yet and probably never will be. They prefer ink on paper. So the geriatric gardener, the book was born. Awesome. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Susan. What compelled or inspired you to write your book? Well, I didn't intend to write two books so closely together, <laughs> to be honest. And after I finished writing about insects for the pest handbook, my editor at Cool Springs Press asked if I'd be interested in writing a book about vegetable plant diseases. And I thought, yeah, that's a great topic. But then I started thinking about the different types of challenges that tend to come a vegetable gardener's way. Maybe it's germination or pollination issues. Maybe it's weather challenges, which golly, everybody's dealing with those all over the place. Maybe it's plant disorders, which are things that aren't caused by disease pathogens. Maybe they're dealing with critters in the garden that love your veggies as much as you do. And how do you deal with them? And yes, vegetable plant diseases. So I put together an outline of how I thought this book could be and submitted it to her. And she said, I love this. Let's get working. And I thought, what have I just done to myself? <laughs> I've given myself a new project. But, you know, I did a ton of research for this. And I just felt like as a master gardener, it's important for me to share what I've learned over the years and what I have learned through research, et cetera. And um, so I'm really pleased with how it turned out, but yeah, I've been busy. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And Teresa, what compelled or inspired you to write your book? Well, um, I got started on this project here when I got a call from Nick and Allison McCullough. They're two garden designers that I got to know by writing about their amazing garden outside Columbus, Ohio for a couple magazines. And, um, we gathered on their patio and it was during the pandemic and Nick um, said he had visited several garden designer friends, home gardens over the years. And during the pandemic, he was staying in touch with them and following along on their different COVID projects through social media. And so he was thinking that wouldn't it be fun to have all of these garden designers uh, featured together in a book. And um, so I was sold and we started moving forward on what would become American Roots. And uh, we decided Nick would serve as the curator for the book and the lead photographer. Allison was the lead designer. And then I was the writer. And so um, we pitched the book to Timber Press and um, started on the book journey that became uh, American Roots. So it's been a fun project. Awesome, thank you for that. Our second question, which zone or region do you garden in and what are you planning to do in your next garden? Let's start with Dwayne. I live in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. It's region or zone five, um, so. We're still just coming out of winter. And uh, as far as what I'm going to do, um, my garden is 20 years old and quite mature. So I'm gonna try planting seeds, um, ornamental seeds in containers this spring. I've never planted from seed before. I've always let nurserymen take care of that. All right. Uh, it's, it's fun to do from seed, that's for sure. Thank you, Duane. Susan, what zone or region are you in and what are you planning to do with your garden this season? I live in Spokane, Washington, which is about 300 miles east of Seattle. And we are in hardiness zone 5B, although a lot of Spokane is in 6A. We just got lucky uh, 
finding property in a microclimate. <laughs> so it's a little bit colder here. Uh, so we are almost to the Idaho border. It's quite dry here. We have a very cold, snowy winter. I know a lot of folks, when they hear about the state of Washington, they think it rains here all the time, but where we are, it's, it's definitely a dry climate. And my big plan for this year is to get better at succession planting. And what that means is if you're on the ball and you can plant uh, get the maximum out of your garden, basically. So let's say you're growing something that's kind of slow to develop like cabbage. You can plant other things around it that you'll harvest before they're going to be in the way of the cabbage as the heads get bigger. Or as soon as you've harvested something out of a bed, you already are ready to replant it with something else. So that's the name of the game. It requires an awful lot of planning and I'm trying really hard to get better at that. Thank you, Susan. Oh boy, I hear you on that planning part. I like to just <laughs> throw seeds out and see what happens. Next, Teresa, which zone are you in and what are you gonna do next in your garden? Well, I live outside Columbus, Ohio in zone six, but this definitely right here is not uh, Columbus, Ohio. I'm in South Florida for tonight, um, <laughs> visiting with some family. And, um, but back home, uh, we have lots of clay soil and we have lots of deer. Um, so those present some definite challenges. I have some formal garden beds around the house. It's sort of a country style house in a rural setting. And we have stylized meadows farther out from the house. Um, I lean on a lot of tough deer resistant plants, a lot of natives, and then I do grow some fussier things um, closer to the house where I can keep an eye on them. I have an enclosed vegetable and cutting garden um, to keep the deer away. And the project that I'm working on next um, is to redo a perennial border along some backstone steps. I'm hoping to replace some tired daylilies with some of the new plants I discovered from the garden designers on, as we prepared the American Roots book, um, perhaps some plants like uh, Nicotiana or Verbascum and uh, Burnett too, so. Awesome, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm new to Asheville. I moved from Phoenix, Arizona to Asheville last year and I am trying elderberries. I have a hundred elderberry plants to put in the ground. So I'm very excited about that. Beautiful. Next, yeah, they are for sure. Next, we have our first raffle for Susan's book, The Yay. Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. Diane is going to choose a winner. And if you're the lucky one, please private message Diane in the chat with your shipping address. Diane? Well, first, I think we wanted to have Lisa answer that question. She was the last oh. one on the list. And I think we, we were so excited about the book. I got so excited. <laughs> there we go. All right, we'll do that in a minute. Lisa, sorry about you, that. Lisa. You could have just... Up right on going. No, I'm in, zone, uh, I'm in near Detroit, so I'm in I, zone 6A, 5B. Um, and I, Teresa, the, the deer here, I mean, last night there was just like four or five of them out in the back, and I'm so tired of deer, but I'm talking about indoor plants. So what am I doing? <laughs> and and I also need to get Dwayne's um, book because I had back surgery last year, so I didn't pull one weed last year. So you can imagine what I'm going to be doing this year, weeding, mm -hmm. a lot of weeding with a long Oh, I guess, because I can't, still can't bend very well. But anyway, um, it's, I'm inside. I am just planted up some, uh, repotted some plants today. It's that time of year when your plants uh, start waking up inside. Um, you can, and you see new growth. It's time to up pot them, repot them if they need them. Um, you can start fertilizing. Um, I don't, I, and if you have, like, I have a, it's hard to tell. Well, it isn't hard to tell. You can see this brightness behind me. I have a big light hanging from the ceiling. And I got a lot of plants growing under it. So those plants that are under lights, if you have plants under lights, you could be fertilizing those or repotting those, you know, all year long if you need. But that's what I'm going to start doing because, you know, there's nothing I can do outside right now here. It's it's rainy. It's cold. It's I'm, it's probably still going to snow. But um, the two, the pansies came into the garden center today. So tomorrow, pansies on the porch. <laughs> My first, you know, plantings. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And now we have our first raffle yes. <laughs> of Susan's book, The Vegetable Garden Problem Solver. Yes, we need a drum roll here or something, you know. <laughs> okay, we're going to draw. I have my little cup here. So we're gonna draw the first name. 
and hopefully I don't mispronounce anything. Um, Sharon Pugh, you are the winner of Susan's book. So Sharon, please direct message me your mailing address. I will share, share that with Susan. Wow, that's a lot of S's there. Sharon <laughs> won Susan's book and will message me the mailing address and we'll get the book out to you. So congratulations, Sharon. Yes, congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And our third question, who is this book designed for and why? And let's start with Susan. This book is designed for any gardener. Um, if you're a brand new gardener, it's going to be great for you. If you are an experienced gardener, it still is packed with information that will help you out. And I wanted to point out that it is not a regional garden book. This is one that is applicable no matter where you live. I did so much research for this book, naturally because I wanted it to be accurate. And there's a lot of complex topics in it, but I wrote it so it was very easy to understand. I didn't make it really sciencey because you know that really will uh, turn me off in a book if it's, if it's just something I'm not grasping. And it's filled with 200 photos, 200 plus photos. So there's lots of things to help you uh, diagnose the problem that you're dealing with and to uh, have solutions to you. So it's, it's just packed with information and it will be great for any level of gardener. Awesome, thank you. And Teresa, who is this book designed for and why? American Roots is designed for both new and experienced gardeners that are looking for some garden design inspiration. In putting together the book, we focused on three different pillars, the first being the gardener and the experience they bring to their garden design. Second, um, plenty of inspiring images with some informative captions. And then third, practical lessons from each of the gardeners that um, were featured in the book. And a big thanks to those 20 gardens uh, designers that shared their book for American Roots. Awesome, thank you. Lisa, you're up next. Who is this book designed for and why? All right, um, Bloom, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, I designed it for the new, I think it's for the new plant parent as well as the seasoned plant parent. I've included uh, basic plant care, you know, how to take care of your plants in general. And I have included over, you know, over 40 plants with their specific care. And, you know, there wasn't a book out there exclusively about flowering house plants. And um, I think people shy away from them or don't even know, Greg, that the house plants do bloom, <laughs> which most, a lot of them do. And um, so, you know, I wanted them, a lot of times the only flowers they're getting are ones that are in a vase, you know, they're already dead, which nothing against florists. We all like, you know, cut flowers, but, you know, if you can have flowers, in your in your home that are long lasting that you you know brought into bloom whether it's the first time or you're getting it to bloom again i mean i think that's that's pretty amazing you know because a lot of times the flower if you do get a flowering plant it's a holiday plant right and a lot of people are you know points out is out the out in the trash they go or calanchoes they're done blooming or cyclamen or um you know mums azaleas you know florist azaleas they just get thrown out. So, um, but I want to show people that there are, I want to give them confidence to actually grow some houseplants in their home that can be flowering all year long. Awesome. Thank you. And Dwayne, who is this book designed for and why? It's designed for the older gardener because uh, some of them are thinking they're going to have to give up gardening and they don't have to. Uh, but it's good for people of all ages because some of the younger gardeners who read this might be able to postpone or even eliminate some of the problems that we're suffering now. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question, tell us about one interesting thing you learned while writing your book. Teresa, let's start with you. Uh, one thing I learned in this book is the value of embracing place in designing a garden. For example, in Austin, Texas, we love how Tate Mooring stacked limestone um, to create this wall and topped it then with a coyote fence of juniper logs. And it truly looks um, at home in his canyon garden. 
but it wouldn't have the same effect in Aaron Shannon's uh, Lakeside Coastal Garden in Wisconsin, uh, where her perennial borders really um, shine and are the perfect fit. So these regionally focused gardens not only are more authentic, but they're also less maintenance and more successful. Nice, thank you, Teresa. And Lisa, tell us one interesting thing you learned while writing your book. Um, I think this is something I learned when I, I, I've written more than one, but I just, and it's just something I want people to know that great plant people are just great people. People who love plants are wonderful people. They share their knowledge, they share plants. They're extremely supportive of other plant people. When I had questions, um, you know, I went to the, I'm in the Bromeliad Society, I'm in the African Violet Society, I'm in the Cactus Society, and all those people, if I had a question about a plant, a specific plant, because you can't know everything, we all know that, um, they were just so willing to share with me and um, support me. And I'm, I just want to tell everybody, you know, if you, if you haven't, aren't in a plant society, you should be. Those are some of my best friends. All of you, I wouldn't know all of you if it wasn't for plants and gardening mm -hmm. and author writing books. I mean, and many of you here are, you know, also good friends. I, I, I love it. And I also learned, I have a lot of family history with my plants, my grandmas, my mom, um, many aunts and uncles, they all share that love of plants. And we're going to, my husband and I, we own a garden center. We're going to pass that down that we pass the love of plants down to our daughters. And pretty soon I'm going to be teaching those grandchildren about plants and nature. They're going to be little nice. nature nerds, <laughs> a little plant nice. nerds. <laughs> nice. I can't wait. And so. Dwayne, what is one interesting, excuse me, <clears throat> Dwayne, what is one interesting thing you learned while writing your book? That I could do it and by self-publishing, I could do it my way. Nice. And then take, take notes on that, everybody. That's uh, <laughs> pretty good. Thank you. Susan, what is one interesting thing you learned while writing your book? I finally got the answer to something that has been puzzling me for a while. If you've ever tried to order plants in the alley, family by mail order. So things like uh, garlic, onions, shallots, or those beautiful ornamental allium bulbs that we all love to plant and enjoy their blooms during spring and summer. But you've seen that either you can't order them or you've noticed that they're restricted in shipping them to certain states. I now know why. There is a horrible plant disease called allium white rot. If you get it in your garden, you will not be able to plant anything in the allium family for at least eight years. You also have to dig out the soil that those plants that were diseased uh, were growing in because the pathogens can live in the soil for up to 30 years. This is a horrible plant disease. And so now I know why there were all these restrictions. And actually there are restrictions to Washington state and Idaho state. And the thing that I wanted to point out was that um, it's the agricultural departments in the different states that are putting in those restrictions because they're trying to protect the commercial growing of those types of crops. You do not want allium, allium white rot in your garden, that's for sure. Yeah, oh, wow. You know, one of the reasons I love doing my podcast and interviewing people is because I get to learn tidbits like that. <laughs> that we th can then take forward. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Our next question, when you give talks, what is the most common question you get and how do you answer it? Let's start with Lisa. Okay. When I, um, I just did finish doing this talk about Bloom um, quite a few times. I've been, I was at a home show or a couple home shows. So I had a lot of questions, but the most asked question was, why is my plant not blooming? Right. So uh, I tell them it may be the wrong time of year. If it's, everything is cyclical. So if you're plant, if you've had a plant a year or more, after, you know, it's done blooming and then within a year, it hasn't bloomed again, then something has to change. So um, usually I tell them though, it, there's a few reasons, but usually it's because it doesn't have enough light. Um, you may not have it in enough light for your plant to, you know, they have light's the only place they're getting energy. So, and um, food. So if they aren't in enough light to, to have enough energy to make flowers, then it's not going to bloom. So it doesn't matter if you have the best potting mix, the best fertilizer on the planet. If it's if it doesn't have the right light, it's not going to bloom. So that's my most asked question. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Dwayne, when you give talks, what is the most common question you get and how do you answer it? Well, I must 
give too much information or something because the audiences are all writing furiously. They take impeccable notes. Um, but one question I get has nothing to do with, with uh, adaptive gardening. I, I use a walker, so I can't stand up and and speak. So I have a director's chair that I take, and it's not your ordinary one. It's a fancy one with a with a a shelf and a cup holder and uh, all the bells and whistles. Afterwards, uh, people come up and ask me, "Where'd you get the the chair?" <laughs> Uh, if anybody save you answering it, I got it uh, off of Cabela's website. Uh, Cabela and Best Pro Shops both sell it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Next, uh, Susan, when you give talks, what is the most common question you get and how do you answer it? I always get what is this bug and how do I get rid of it? <laughs> it doesn't yep. matter whether I'm giving a talk or answering emails, there's always something about insects. And the first thing I do is I emphasize the importance of um, identifying it. You know, sometimes there are beneficial insects that are pretty creepy looking and you think, oh, that's gotta be a bad bug. And then you find out, in fact, it's a beneficial insect. So first we get over the hurdle of identifying what it is. If it's a beneficial insect, I explain what they do, you know, what types of uh, prey they have. Uh, a lot of times it's aphids and all kinds of nasty things. And I uh, talk about how to attract more of them, more beneficial insects to their gardens. If it's a damaging insect, I focus on organic methods and uh, strategies and products uh, to control them. And the main thing I try to get across to folks is that pesticides are not the answer. The problem is they're non-selective. And what that means is, sure, you can find a pesticide to kill off the aphids, but it doesn't know the difference between an aphid and a beneficial insect that would have helped control the problem for you. So it will kill those beneficial insects as well. So the main thing is um, just trying to educate folks about which kind of insect they're dealing with and then uh, pointing them in the right direction as far as either uh, organic methods or how to promote more of the good bugs in their gardens. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I get that question a lot about mushrooms and bugs. Oh. And, and people are, you know, always curious about, well, how do, the first place we go is, how do I get rid of it? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, hold on, let's explore and see what the value of it is. It, had, it was put here for a reason. Right. I used to have uh, folks say, well, it has to be a bad bug because it has red eyes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily hold true. So don't use that as your guideline. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Susan. Teresa, when you give talks, what is the most common question you get and how do you answer it? Sure. Um, one of the most popular questions we get is what is our favorite among the 20 gardens? And oh, that's got to be hard. It's hard to say. It really is because they're all wonderful uh, for different reasons. Um, for example, Peter Bavacqua's garden in Claverack, New York, is super creative and meticulously cared for. He creates these garden rooms with hedges and clipped boxwoods. Then he mixes in these contrasting wild plants. Um, like in the center of this one garden room, he had a native compass plant that was soaring uh, in the, as a centerpiece, along with these swaths of golden cone flowers. And he's uh, just very creative. Um, he studied at Great Dixter, the, Engl the famous English garden, and he was a former advertising executive before he got started in landscape design. So I love how he uses his garden to play and push the boundaries and try new things and juxtapose odd things together like informal and formal garden elements. Awesome. Thank you. And I got all four of you now. And we have a second book raffle. It's Dwayne's book, The Geriatric Gardener, Adaptive Gardening Advice for Seniors. 
Diane's going to choose a winner and the lucky person, please message Diane with your shipping address. Okay, I have Marie Hadley. Congratulations, Marie, you get Dwayne's book and message me your mailing address. Yay. Awesome, thank you. All right, our next question. What plant, oh, I love this question. What plant or product do you rec recommend every gardener try? Let's start with Dwayne. Tillandsia. I have a big collection of Tillandsia along with a, quite a few house plants. Mm -hmm. And after a 2020 stroke, um, I found it kind of hard to walk on a walker and carry a watering can. So, uh, but I can uh, still take care of the, the Tillandsia. I go around the house every other week with a container and it's it's like a, a bus going to day camp you know i collect them all and off we go to the swimming pool which <laughs> nice. is kitchen sink after an hour and a half i take them out of the water dry them off and the bus goes back home um, and my sweetheart linda is taking care of the uh, the house plants and they they seem to thrive on her way of doing it better than mine and the Tillandsia are all doing well. Nice. So Thank you. Uh, one of the Tillandsia that I have is one of the original two that I bought at a, a community 4th of July um, open house wow. 35 years ago. And it's wow. still <laughs> And you, you grow them in pots? Oh, they're in plot, pots, they're in cactus logs. One is sitting on the top of a, a concrete, a little concrete Volkswagen bus planter. Oh, and nice. So they're, they're in all different places around the house. Awesome. Thank you, Dwayne. Susan, what plant or product do you recommend every gardener try? My new favorite product is something that's known as agricultural insect netting, agricultural mesh or garden insect netting. It's something that I was always seeing on uh, British gardening programs. And I kept thinking, why can't I find this to get here in the States? Well, as of January of 2022, I finally found a source for it. And it is a mesh that you can put over a planting <clears throat> excuse me, that um, will keep, it acts as a barrier to keep uh, damaging insects away from plants that don't require pollination. So think of cabbage family crops and the cabbage worms and the aphids. So this has really fine mesh and I used it last year over the broccoli and the beets. The uh, aphids could not get through it, which is great. And what I really like about it is that you can see the plants right through the mesh. And so you don't have to lift up the cover to see how the plants are doing. You can just look right through it. It is a great product. It's my new go-to barrier for keeping damaging insects away from plants. And I would much rather use a barrier than use even an organic product. I think just keeping them away from the plants is perfect. Nice, and what's it called? It's called- okay. Agricultural, right. agricultural insect netting, agricultural mesh, or garden insect netting. Awesome. And where do you find it? There's a company that's called, uh, there's probably more than one source now, but it's called gardenport.com. And if you look under um, where it says netting, uh, it has one that's garden netting, and that is uh, the category you want to look for. Awesome. Thank you. Teresa, what is one plant or product you recommend every gardener try? Well, I think for a long time, perennials have kind of been the plant darlings in the garden design world. And so I think people now are starting to have a greater appreciation for the role that annuals can play in weaving a garden together or adding pops of color throughout the seasons. And we definitely saw this um, theme as we visited gardens um, for this book, American Roots. And we traveled to different uh, gardens and saw how they would layer self-sewers like foxglove and snow daisies 
or they would bring in some drama with um, some plants like uh, castor beans and bronze fennel. So I say add more annuals. Awesome. Thank you. Lisa, what plant or product do you recommend every gardener try? Uh, well, I'm, I'm with Duane. You, everybody should have at least 10 or 15 tillandsias. I got, <laughs> I have so many, um, but I just, I have to show, look at these. Everybody should have a Phalaenopsis orchid. That's my opinion. You can find them everywhere. That's why they're called the grocery store orchid. This, mm -hmm. The Trader Joe orchid, the Meyer orchid, the <laughs> Kroger orchid, the, all the, or, all the places you can get them. So easy to grow. You just, t you know, they come in these cash pows, you know, with no, no uh, drainage. So I take them out, take them to the sink. I run water through it, I let it drain, and then I put it back in the cash pot and put it back where everybody can see it because it is a beautiful plant. And the other one, I'm, I'm taking two because um, we're talking about blossom, blooming plants. How about an African violet? You know mm. what? My grandma gave me this love for African violets. If she could see the African violet, she had pink, blue, and purple. Well, they call them blue, pink, blue, and white. We call them purple, they call them blue. Um, to pick from. And now they have all these frilly pink ones and they have striped ones and they have beautiful foliage. And if you have this and the, that Phalaenopsis orchid, you probably will have, one of these will be in bloom every day of the year. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm saying. So everybody should try this. Don't, don't poo poo the African violet because it is a beautiful plant. Nice. And Diane's telling us that uh, 2023 is the year of the orchid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nice. Our next question, what is one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? Let's start with Susan. I think more than anything, my message in the book is you can do this. You know, I don't want people to think, oh, gosh, gardening must be one problem after another because Susan wrote a book about it. Actually, I, I've written it in a very positive way. There are a lot of different things that you might never experience at all. Uh, you know, a lot of it depends upon the region you live in and, you know, what the conditions are and so on. But really overall gardening is such a joy. And if someone has a problem with their garden, this new book is going to walk you through what it is, how to deal with it, and hopefully uh, how to uh, prevent future instances of the problem. Awesome, thank you. Teresa, what is one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your So for each chapter, um, we ask the garden designer to share a lesson. And so in one case it might be how to create a gravel garden or how to design vignettes within the garden or even um, how to uh, create a stylized meadow. And so um, we love sharing those as well as some of the favorite garden tools uh, that these gardeners use. One being a garden knife with an offset handle. Another was a Dutch hoe. And then another um, gardener used these curved handles pruning shears. So we loved learning their favorite tools. Nice, thank you. And Lisa, what is one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? Well, I hope that what they take from the book is not only just that they can grow flowering plants, but they have a list of flowering houseplants that they want to get to have in their home. And I want them to have the, conf I want them to have that takeaway of confidence that they can have plants blooming in their home year round. It's, it's, <coughs> it's, not, it's not that hard if you have the right light and you're taking good care of your plants and, um, you know, you have it in the right place. You can, you can find in these 40 or more houseplants that I have in blooming houseplants in this book, I hope that you can find, they can find at least one that they like and are successful with. Nice, thank you, thank you. And Dwayne, what is one gardening takeaway folks will learn from your book? Uh, the one takeaway is that gardening is more enjoyable when you tend it instead of toil in it. And I, I read that in somebody else's book and I can't for the life of me uh, remember who it is. So thank you anyway. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question, tell us about your biggest garden goof and what you learned from it. And before I call on somebody here, this is one of my favorite things to ask because when we make a mistake or make a goof, that's where we learn our best lessons. So uh, yeah, that's, this is one of my favorite questions of all time. So Teresa, 
gardening goof? Oh, um, my biggest garden goof, um, probably planting plants that end up being too aggressive uh, or even invasive. And it all started pretty naively 20 years ago when I planted um, some morning glories with my husband around our vegetable garden fence. And the next spring and even this spring, I'm still pulling um, morning glory vines every year (laughs) out of uh, from around the fence. So um, I learned, um, I have made the goof again, you know, and uh, have run into other aggressive plants. Um, And in some cases, I intentionally plant some of these self sowers that have abundant seeds, like maybe um, nigella, uh, just knowing ruthlessly, I'm going to prune them out and pull them in the spring, uh, thin them. So I think you have to kind of, if you're going to do it, do it intentionally and not neglect then pulling them in the spring. And the biggest takeaway, I think, is you just have to research your plants beforehand. And then once you plant them, observe them um, and you learn a lot. Cool. Thank you. Lisa, what is your biggest gardening goof? So um, I don't know if it's a goof, but I'm going to say it's kind of a regret. So I guess it was a goof. Um, a few regrets. I remember more than others. One is that I used, I had grandma's um, African violets that she had on her windowsill. I inherited a couple of them. And I, I was young. I had I had two babies on my hip and I just didn't, I didn't take good care of it. It got mealybugs and they died. And I'm so regretful that all I had to do was take a leaf, walk, wipe it down, start a new leaf. And I could, and I could have kept doing that and I could still have her plant. So I, I really, I really regret that. So you, you have to really pay better attention. So, and also, um, I don't, I mean, you, if you, I'm sure you've all heard about the houseplant craze, right? So I, I used to have a variegated monstera. There's nothing new in the world, you know, variegated monsteras have been here for a long time. And I had one, and for some reason, I don't know why, it just, it, it didn't live in my care. I mean, I had it for a long time. And I regret it because if I had it now, even though I probably wouldn't cut it up, I could have been rich. <laughs> I could have been very rich. Um, I also had a, a pink princess uh, uh, philodendron a long time ago, too. So um, I, I, I do regret that I didn't take better care of those. But I do have my grandmother's, uh, my mom's 1957 uh, fern from her bridal shower. And um, believe me, I'm taking good care of it. I also have mine from my 1984 bridal shower. So they're, they're to being, I I pay attention to those and make sure they're well taken care of because I would just be sick if I I lost those. So there you go. Pay attention to your plants. (laughs) There you go. Thank you. And Dwayne, what about your biggest gardening goof? Well, here we are in the landscaping profession. My son uh, is in the landscaping profession actually down your way he lives in greensboro and uh he designed the the landscape when we built this house and uh my client who was the top landscape uh, company put it in but we put a fringe tree on the corner and then on the corner of the house next to the fringe tree, we put a, a weeping mulberry. And I thought the weeping mulberry would be short, like some of these weeping cherries and my Japanese red maple. But it grew and it grew and it grew uh, taller than the house. Probably the largest uh, diameter trunk messed up the roof, uh, put debris in the gutters. Uh, and on the other side, it, it put out enough shoots that it was off balance. So finally, I bit the bullet and had it uh, taken out last last uh, summer. Uh, and so this summer, I'm going to enjoy, or this spring, I'm going to enjoy working on my patio and what, enjoying the white fringe tree flowers. Takeaway is do your due diligence, read your plant tags. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dwayne. And Susan, your biggest garden goof, and what did you learn from it? Well, this is really embarrassing, but I'm willing to share it because I want to save other gardeners some grief. Back in 2020, at the end of the garden season, I was really disappointed in our carrot harvest. And so I told my husband, Bill, who takes care of the 
drip irrigation system that we have in the garden and how long it runs and so on. And I said, you know, we just didn't water those carrots enough. And so he said, okay, for next year, I'm gonna make changes. So he added some micro misters to the bed and he um, increased the time that the carrots were getting watered. So it comes time to harvest them in the fall. And you can imagine my horror and heartbreak when I discovered that every single carrot had split wide open. It was the most bizarre, strange looking thing. And so no carrots to eat that, that winter. So anyway, um, we discovered that there is apparently a fine line between giving the carrots enough water and giving them too much. So last year we dialed it back a little bit and we ended up with a very nice carrot harvest, but lesson learned. <laughs> awesome, thank you, there you go. And uh, you know, failures happen to all of us and we just have to take a deep breath and make sure that we learn from them. We actually have a bonus round question for the authors and we're gonna let you self choose. So if you wanna answer this question, great. If not, that's fine. And you just can jump in. Uh, and uh, the question is, what challenges did you face getting your book published? Who wants to go first? I will. Hey, Dwayne, go for it. Uh, I got the manuscript finished uh, towards the end of uh, 2019. And on February 12th of 2020, I had a stroke, mm. and so that put me behind. Wow. And I, I just about got going when the pandemic hit, so the printers weren't uh, working, and so it was just delay after delay, and finally got it off and running. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else want to take a stab at this? Well, for my oh. pest hand book, so the previous book, that was uh, the um, pandemic was just starting up. And so there we didn't have as many delays for my book as some of my colleagues did for their books. But, um, you know, I had intended to take a lot of photos, of different kinds of insects around the country. And, you know, there was no travel going on during the pandemic at all. Unfortunately, Cool Springs Press was awesome because they sourced a lot of photos that I couldn't get. But um, I, I'd say the pandemic uh, certainly had an impact on a lot of authors' books, especially with the shipping issues where all of the container ships were backed up and, you know, cargo wasn't getting offloaded. Oh, very good. Thank you. Anybody else? I have to say that I, I, I'm, my books are from Cool Springs Press and I really didn't have any other than the, yeah, the shipping that, you know, the date had to get moved back a little bit, but otherwise they're a dream to work with. Yes, I, I thoroughly agree. Yes. I've heard that before actually. Yes. And mine was the same thing, uh, uh, some shipping delays due to supply chain issues. Um, but I think it sounds like that was a common theme among all of us. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all for that. And thank you for the person that asked that question. Um, we're going to go into our breakout rooms now, uh, one for each author. At the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a button that says breakout room. Click on it and it will let you select a room, an author that you would like to chat with. We're going to be doing this for 15 to 20 minutes and then come back to the main room to finish up. And please note, we still have two books to give away. Uh, so we're, let's jump into the, um, all <laughs> right, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, we hope you enjoyed that conversation with the authors. Um, we do have our third raffle, uh, and we're going to give away two books. First one is for Teresa's book, American Roots, Lessons and Inspiration from the Designers of Reimagining, Designers Reimagining Our Home Gardens. Diane? And our winner is Sue Mings, M-I-N-G-S, Sue Mings. All right, Sue, if you could uh, shoot your mailing address over to Diane in a private chat, that would be great. And our final book giveaway is Lisa's book, 
I have my fingers crossed, although I know I'm not in the pot, but I win it. <laughs> I do too. I know. I went to some of those other books myself. <laughs> right. Lisa's book is Houseplant Party, Fun nope. Projects. This one is oh, Bloom. Bloom. We're going to give away Bloom. <laughs> oh, we're giving away Bloom. Absolutely. We are. That's awesome. my newest book. Okay, cool. We do have Houseplant Party. It's back there someplace. It but is this is one there. <laughs> okay. Um, Carol O. Nap Napich. K-N-A-P-I-T-S-H. Yes, that's me. Yay, there you, there you go. Okay. Thank you so much. So awesome. Carol, please private message me your mailing address. Awesome. Hey. Awesome. Now I'd like to invite Kathy and Diane back to wrap up our awesome event. Ooh. So I was just going to say that was so inspiring and I'm invigorated and ready to go out and garden for the season. It's such a beautiful spring day here in DC too. I feel like, Ooh, I'm ready after this. So thank you to our authors, Lisa, Susan, Diane, Dwayne, Teresa, and our podcaster host, Greg. We appreciate you sharing your gardening passion with us. As you can see, the members of GardenCom come from many different backgrounds, many different interests, but all equally talented and inspiring. And to learn more about Garden Communicators International, go to GardenCom.org. And I think Diane is popping that in the uh, chat box. And I'll turn it over now to Diane. And what else can I say? It was a great event. We loved hearing about our authors. Every time I meet these authors, I learn something new about them. So from everyone at National Garden Bureau, thank you and stay tuned for, Greg is gonna tell us about what's coming this fall. Awesome, thank you both. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, one uh, little piece here, if you wanna save the chat with the links at the bottom of the chat window, you click on the ellipsis and then click save chat. That will save your chat to your local recording location. And usually it's a default in your documents folder and there, it'll, it'll open up uh, once you save it. So if you wanna save the chat, just go to the uh, chat window, click on the ellipsis and you can do that. I'd also like to announce the fall 2023 book party details, save the date. We don't have the authors yet. That would be November 9th, 2023. So put that on your schedule. And I also want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And remember, in the words of Vincent Van Gogh, I love this quote, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. So be encouraged that each lesson learned and skill developed. You are one step closer to your dream Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here.